No, no, you still have to sleep. Like, <laughs> no, no. You can't just eat broccoli and get adjusted and think that you're going to be healthy. That, that, that's not a thing. God. All right. So anyway, then that's why we wonder why we run on to – that's why I stay away from those words like complementary and alternative because this is the kind of stuff that it encompasses. And, and it can really drag your profession down into the gutter and really hurt your credibility. Like that's you – know, those aren't the people you want to be associated with. And you don't, we don't want those people coming through here because they'll get out and they're using that name and that reputation of napropathy and then this is what they're going to find. And, you know, unfortunately, some of those professions tend to be umbrellas for shenanigans, for weird alternative practices, you know, whether it's muscle testing or, I mean, like, why do we need a muscle test for allergies? Like, we have a lot of tests for that. You can do skin testing. You can check blood tests, like, that are a lot more effective and efficient. We're talking gold standards. We're not going to pull in your deltoid to see if you're allergic to walnuts or something like that. I mean, it's, it's just silly. It really is silly. I don't have other words, you know, to use for it, you know. All right, so let's talk pelvic movement. So when we're talking pelvic movement, what I want to talk about is the way that I like to teach this is in three components. So one is the monoarthropathic movements of the pelvis. So that would be under the impression that all those bones are fused together, that they do not move interdependently. So they can't operate, you can't get a tilt, you can't get a slip, the sacrum doesn't nutate or counter nutate individually, that this is one solid pelvis, okay? And the reason why I want to start out and work like an Occam's razor from most simplistic to, to more advanced, because they all exist on a spectrum like we talked about, is if you start to pay attention to specific pelvic motions, whether it's ilia movement or sacral movements or whatever else, you can make yourself so convinced that you have no idea where to start with. Right? So if I have an external flare on the right side, what does that do to the femur? Well, it does this and this and this. Well, if it does that, will it also cause the, you know, the sacrum to tilt anteriorly and mutate? Then what does that do to L5 and L4 and like you'll get so confused by trying to assess something in that way. I think it's actually a detriment to even learn it that way yet until you've mastered the simplistic way of looking at things. So when we're talking monoarthropathic movement, what we're going to say is that there's only a few ways that it can move, right? So it can move into anterior pelvic tilt. Okay. It can move into posterior pelvic tilt. All right. We can have a lot left rotation of the whole thing. So the reference points, the ASIS. So my left hip can go forward. My right can go back. And then you can have a right rotation reference point of the ASIS. So the causes of that, generally speaking, would be muscle tightness. So if I had a posterior pelvic tilt, quote-unquote, some of my tight muscles would be my hamstrings, right, my rectus abdominis, so opposite end. So they're going to pull in that direction that's going to cause a posterior pelvic tilt. All right, anterior would be the opposite, right? My hip, my rectus femoris, my hip flexors are going to pull me forward. Then my erectors, maybe my glutes are going to overengage to give me that tilt. Okay. So secondarily, if we want to start to think that far along, those would go hand in hand with either lordosis or lack of lordosis or kyphosis. It's not truly kyphosis, right? In the L spine, you don't have kyphosis. Now, you may see somebody having a back spasm that looks like they have a kyphosis because they're spasm pulling them away from the pain, but it's still a lordotic structure. So somebody that has hyperlordosis or maybe they have a spondylolisthesis, they may have that anterior tilt you know, where, where we're tipping up on the back end. So particularly if you have a spondy, because what that is, it's a fracture of the pars like we've talked about previously. And they're graded through four grades, so they'll slide forward relative to other vertebrae. These are commonly seen, I think they were, and I've got a statistic somewhere, like 90% of Inuits, um, whether that's genetic or it has to do with the ice or the backpacks, we don't really know. But that has been observed. And then we've also observed that like gymnasts and other, other kids that are really active at an early age tend to have these degenerative type sp uh, uh, spondies. Um, which is probably from impact while they're growing, and then later on they end up with the spiny symptoms. Okay. But having one of those is more likely to lead you towards a lord lordotic position because it's going to overaccentuate that position. So if we're looking at the the pelvis as a consequence of the lumbar spine, that may be something we see, to where we see a lordosis, but we assume that it's because of the pelvic position based on the muscles. Well, how would we rule in or out L spine versus the muscles? The easiest way would be to treat the muscles and then see if it changed, right? So if I, had a, if I thought I had an anterior pelvic tilt that was muscular, I would treat erector spinae, glute max, rectus femoris, and then I'd reassess. So I know that my inhibition, right, like pressing on the muscles, should loosen those muscles and take the tension off of it. And then when I recheck it, if I'm correct, then it should even out somewhat. From there, I could go about strengthening the opposite if that was truly a problem. Now, we don't want to correct posture just for the sake of correcting posture. Like a lot of people's postures are that way for a reason. They're, they're either genetically that way or it's protecting them from something. So like if they're not having problems, you don't necessarily want to correct posture. Everybody has different shapes of their kyphosis. Like, like uh, Dr. Gamera, for example, has a pretty, pretty uh, um, 
pronounced kyphosis. That's just the way his spine moves. It's beneficial in some ways, but it also predisposes him towards, you know, upper back and neck issues as well. My spine, I actually have healed Sherman's disease, so my spine, I don't have a kyphosis in my T-spine. My kyphosis is actually at the, the thoracolumbar junction, which is where I have compression fractures and schmorl's nodes and things like that. But I basically can't really have bad posture other than the scapula is rotating forward. My spine is so straight that I can't do this. It's just not the shape of my spine. So, you know, some of those things can't really be changed because of the shape of the vertebrae are what's causing it. So I, don't, I shouldn't go about trying to correct that posture just because I'm trying to fit some ideal posture. There's, there really is no such thing. Now, if your consequences are pain and then you think that it's associated with posture, then by all means, go ahead and address that. But, you know, that's not always the case. Some people's postures are just that way, and that's, you know, that's kind of who they are. That's the way their bones are shaped. So, all right, so the monoarthropathic movements, the theory assumes the ilia, the ischia, the pubic bones, and the sacrum move essentially as one unit. This is the most simplistic theory of pelvic motion. So, yeah, anterior pelvic tilt, the ASIS moves the anterior and inferior. The lordosis is the associated motion of the lumbar spine. Overactive muscles involved include rectus femoris, sartorius, TFL, iliopsoas, erector spinae, latissimus dorsi, quadravus lumborum. The underactive muscles are rectus abdominis, obliques, and the hamstring group. So we can kind of see that, that picture there, see how it's tilting it. It's a quote-unquote anterior pelvic tilt. A posterior pelvic tilt will look the opposite direction. The overactive muscles are the hamstring group, the rectus abdominis, the obliques, the glute max, and the associated lumbar movement is kyphosis or lack of lordosis. So we can see tight rectus abdominis, tight glute max, tight hamstring. They're going to cause that posterior rotation. Okay, lordosis versus kyphosis. Increased lordosis increases the risk of spondylolisthesis, foraminal stenosis, facet syndrome. So if we have too much lordosis, the facets can become weight-bearing and they start to approximate, which can cause arthritis and they start to wear each other out. All right. Uh, foraminal stenosis can also, it, it's narrowed when we move into extension. That's why if somebody has like a, a herniated disc in their neck, if they look up, it's going to shoot the pain down much worse because what that, that extension does is it closes the foramen or the foramen where that nerve comes out. All right, loss of lordosis increases the risk of disc herniation, ligament strain, and compression fractures or schmorl's nodes. We lose our nice smooth arc and our way of distributing force. So if it's straight up and down, when you look at the spine, it's designed like three curves, right? It's like a spring. So you have a lordosis, kyphosis, and lordosis, and what that allows is a nice transition of forces like a spring. So when I'm walking or jumping, I'm able to distribute that force really well. So if I'm straight up and down, all that force goes directly into the bones, and what can happen is we end up with compression fractures um, or, or schmorl's nodes, which are herniations up into the bone itself. I've got a lot of those. So our second theory is by, excuse me, by arthropathy of the pelvis. So this theory recognizes the sacrum as a unit of the spine and not the pelvis, and as such, movement at the sacroiliac joint and pubic symphysis is to be assessed for pelvic displacement. So we're not really going to think about like the tilting of the sacrum in this particular theory or nutation or counter nutation. We're going to assume that the sacrum is, is connected to L5 and fused to it, which it is really. Right? It's got a disc that attaches it to it. And so if the sacrum was going to move side to side, in order to do that, that disc would have to be able to take a, a tremendous amount of strain or rotational forces or be damaged. So in my opinion, you can't actually move spinal units very well on their own without damage to the ligaments, um, without damage to the disc. Like, there has to be some level of disc damage to be able to move vertebra independently. Like, that's the area of the body that should have the least amount of movement independently, as far as, like, one vertebra and another. However, if I took my sacrum and I twisted it this way, what I'm going to see is, is some level of L5 coming with it, and then a little bit less of L4, and a little bit less of L3, and a little bit less of L2. That's the most realistic um, theory in my mind of how it works. So, uh, in a problem, we learned a... Uh it's called the, the max sacral twist. Basically, you gap the SI joint by moving the sacrum. Um, yeah. So you wouldn't. You, what you'll notice is you'll hurt a lot of people with that. Okay. I never, ever, ever try to treat the sacrum at all. The problem is if you're trying to move the sacrum, you have no other ability to, to recorrect it. So, like, I've seen chiropractors and neighbor breaths and stuff in the past try to push, like, the sacrum P to A. If you're assuming that it needs to move in one direction, assuming that it moves, and you move it too far forward, how do you get it back? Like you're potentially playing with fire in that sense. If it's too far back, that means you can also push it too far forward. Um, so I, I don't treat the sacrum at all. I kind of, I, I, I almost think of it as like the, um, like the flagstone or 
um, like the base, and so I don't really want to mess with it very much. Um, so if he treated the pelvis, right, if that theory of the sacrum is, wouldn't it adjust itself if it needed to? Potentially. Yeah. There's and and the truth is there is no truth to any of this. Like it's, right. these are all theories. There's no scientific consensus on any kind of movement here at all. Um, but I find... I find starting out the monoarthropathic is the most helpful. That way you don't confuse yourself. This is probably the most common and most accurate of the three. So that would recognize that you can have posterior slips and anterior slips of the ilium, generally speaking, um, individually. But we're not really ass assuming that the ischium moves independently. Like we're going to assume the ilium and ischium are essentially one unit there, and they will move forward or back potentially. Maybe some inner out flare, but mostly forward and back. Like when I see people that truly have like sacral movement or inflares or outflares, they're usually a connective tissue disorder or they're pregnant or something like that. Like there's another issue going on there where we have too much relaxin to where we actually do have the capability to have inflares, outflares, um, stuff like that. Okay. So yeah, in, in my personal opinion, and again, it's just my opinion, I don't think that the sacrum should be addressed generally speaking. Um, you don't really see people with sacrum pain very often. If you do, what you're looking at is, is lumbosacral pain, so a fixation there, and so usually a vertical traction will correct that. Or they have sacroiliac dysfunction, and in that case, the joint just needs to be moving well. Okay. So, the first one we'll look at is what we call a quote-unquote upslip. An upslip is half of the pelvis is, extreme, is, a, is an extremely common injury, quote-unquote, for athletes. And I do find this clinically speaking, so when you guys see me like kind of hammering on the PSIS, usually that's what I'm correcting for is a quote-unquote posterior tilt or an upslip. Um, so basically what's happened is is either too much impact or too much muscle tension has caused one side to tilt slightly back. What that also does is it imbricates the sacroiliac joint, particularly if we still have motion there. Uh, so it involves half of the pelvis. Usually the left side is more common than the right, and I would, I would say maybe two-to-one ratio uh, for whatever reason. And there's a lot of theories that float around online about short right leg syndrome, um, some people posit, posit that, you know, we throw with our right hand for a spear, so your left leg would need to be longer. Um, some people posit that you're, you know, we're left brain dominant, so then the right side of our body takes more impact. I think generally speaking, and I have no, I have no, uh, control to verify this. I think it's because we drive with our right foot. So we're constantly putting pressure on it and engaging it. And if you guys have ever tried to use your left foot to drive, or if you still drive an automatic, like most people's quads don't activate as well with the left. Here's another thing I see on people like now that everybody has their phone in their right hand, I'm seeing a lot more left shoulder issues because people are holding the steering wheel here, internally rotating the humerus into the socket there and irritating it. So people are, their shoulders are hurting when they're driving. One really easy fix is just have them come in here. So feel where your posture is at here with your traps and your scapulas. Now come down here and hold the wheel here. Feel the difference? There's a big difference. Kind of relax your traps a little bit too. Right, and get your shoulder blades down and together. Some simplistic things. So, like, and everybody kind of turns their right leg out when they're driving, too. So that can also cause overactivity of the glute max and, and some external flare as well. So if you can coach somebody, you know, I've, I've actually had people get in their cars, and I've looked at the way they're setting up so I can help them to, to realign and to create some cognitive cues to stop them from, you know, bad behaviors there. All right, so this is as a ripple effect on the rest of the lower body. You can change leg length, quote, unquote. So this isn't actual leg length, right? We're just talking about relative leg length. Like, we're not actually changing anything, but, but a pelvic fixation can present and look like a longer or shorter leg. Um, so it can provide an altered neuro, uh, excuse me, neurological feedback loop. All this will impact you or your athlete's ability to run, jump, land, compete, or stay injury-free. So when I was in high school, um, I would constantly get this, like, left SI joint fixation. And the way that I knew it is I would start to gallop. I wouldn't run as well. And I was, you know, I was a 4 5 40 guy. I would start to have some left and anterior knee pain. That was my indicator that I needed to get adjusted. That was my first experience with any chiropractors at all. And it, it was interesting because my chiropractor, like, it was just like the dentist to me. Like, you would go in, and uh, the assistant would walk you back. They'd put you on the table. He would come in. He would check your hips. He would adjust my hip, fix me up, walk right back out. I, didn't, I wasn't aware of all this other weird stuff that's somewhat associated with the profession. Um, so it was just like, you know, once a month during football season, I would go. And, you know, Emmett Smith, Arnold Schwarzenegger, Michael Jordan, Tom Brady, Tiger Woods, um, all, all these people would go off and regularly. So I figured that's, you know, something that I might need as well, you know, playing football. So basically what would happen is that left leg would get a posterior tilt for whatever reason. 
uh, maybe because I'd broken my leg previously on that side and I had a cast. I'm not really sure why. Um, but all it would take was that sideline manipulation on that one. And it would fix me for at least a month. So that was like my first experience with the whole thing. Um, so that would give me that presentation, which I maintained through most of my adult life, even through my spasms and all my major back issues through my mid twenties. Um, however, we'll check it later. Like I've overcorrected it so much that I actually end up with a right one. Now I haven't thrown my back out in almost three years as a result of me overcorrecting it. Um, but it used to be when I would have my students check me, my left leg would be a little bit longer and now it's the right one's almost always a little bit longer. So you can actually change if you if you treat one pattern for long enough, you can actually overcorrect it and create a new pattern. So then what happens is you continue to treat your old pattern, but instead of getting better, it actually gets worse. So if I still did the same things that I used to do as far as like lacrosse ball, stretching, Don Tigney mobs or things like that for my old presentation, it makes me worse. And I've had to recognize this isn't working anymore and then reassess it and move on. Unfortunately, patients and clinicians have a hard time doing that. And just go, well, this always works for you. I don't know why anymore. Well, maybe it, it, that's not the injury they have anymore, the presentation they have anymore. So we need to reassess it or they've done too much. So you have to look in the mirror, right? All right, so the upslip will typically present as the quote-unquote longer leg when they're lying down and almost always has the SI joint associated with the sharp acute pain. The patient will be leaning away from that upslip in an antalgic position and, and usually bent forward. So these are the people that look like a question mark. So if they have left SI joint dysfunction, their left hip will be over to the side, their upper body will be over the right leg, and they won't be able to straighten up. Have you guys seen people like that with a question mark presentation? It's really bad. Uh, so the PSIS will be more cephalic on, and posterior on the upslip side, and they won't be able to, to bear any weight on that SI joint side. Okay. Now, the tricky thing here as a clinician is how do you differentiate an acute disc versus this because they can sometimes present similarly. And I would tell you that one of the main things to do is to check and make sure that they don't have any radiculopathy, like true nerve issues. So you have to run your neuro test. You have to run your pinwheel. You have to run your myo, uh, myotome tests to make sure that they're not actually showing us any, any kind of you know, dermatome or, or myotome presentation, which would indicate more of a disc issue. Because manipulation is best indicated for acute lower back pain in particular. And generally speaking, manipulation is going to work best in acute pain overall. But the scary part about that is the reason why they have acute pain, it could be because we have a fixation, but it could be as a protective mechanism because they're having some sort of underlying pathological issue as well, which you have to be careful with. So like one of the issues we talked about why manipulation fell out of favor in the late 1800s was a rash of tuberculosis. So you can imagine that people's bones would literally shatter if you tried to manipulate them if they had some sort of bone-destroying de disease state. Right, the same thing would be true with somebody with osteopenia or osteoporosis. You could actually break their bones because they can't handle that kind of force. So generally speaking, manipulation is going to work well on young people, people that are in acute pain, so less than 14 days of it. So it doesn't really work all that well on chronic pain. If it's chronic, something else has changed over time. Like the morphology has changed. You can't stay acute forever like that. So your body will create compensation patterns and buttress it and heal areas. Um which may convert to a different type of pain, which is usually fasciitis or some sort of muscle imbalance from side to side or front to back. Eventually, that'll turn into what we call fatty infiltration, so where fat actually starts to overtake the psoas major or the, the uh, multifidi. Now they don't even have the ability to fire anymore because they don't actually have myofibrils. So even when we try to strengthen them, we can't because they don't have the right histological tissue there to act like a muscle. So the upslip can also be caused by a relative jamming motion, hitting the ground too hard, misstepping um, of the other hip joint in which the femur is either jammed up into the socket or subluxed the anterior or inferior, thus dragging the pelvis down on the downslope side. Okay, so what can happen is that femur can come forward on the short leg side, and then what happens is your whole pelvis starts to chase it, drags downward. Then as you walk around, you can have a lot of impact and pain on the high side, which can eventually turn into SI joint dysfunction or really sharp pain. Um, or, like I said, jamming of the hip into the socket. So if you jumped out of the back of a pickup truck and landed really hard on one leg, what it can do is actually jam that femur up into the socket and fixate it, right? And that's going to give us a short leg. So now as we continue to ambulate around or run, now that other leg is longer, and now it's going to cause too much impact on that SI joint. Because leg length and movement is something where we generally want as much symmetry as we can get. Okay. So inferior gluteal trigger points can often relieve the tension on the shorter leg side. So counterintuitively, the patient will have no pain at rest on the downslip side or the opposite side, but significantly more pain on palpation. So they'll generally be lacrosse balling their symptomatic side. So like the, if I have that left you know, uh, symptomatic side, 
they'll think they need a bunch of soft tissue work there, but what you'll find is the right lower side is where all the money's made. And when you press around the piriformis attachment point, the gemellus, um, the lower sacral attachment points, it's going to be very sharp on the asymptomatic side. So by treating that area, and here's what I think actually goes on in most cases of sacral joint dysfunction, the dominant side gets so tight that the SI joint doesn't move at all on that side. It's not painful yet, but the other side is moving too much relatively. And so as we create extra motion there, eventually it starts to irritate it. And then your body seizes up and, sh and we get that sharp stabbing pain. So when you clear the other side, get the glutes to stop yanking on the sacrum, all of a sudden that one has some wiggle to it. And so the symmetrical wiggle is much more even. They have a lot less pain. Everybody wants to go and attack the symptomatic side, but it's really not going to be all that effective, particularly with soft tissue work. And this is just years and years of clinical experience telling you this. Treating the SI joint, if you can get it to move, if they're not that acute, will help a lot. Like on young people, a lot of times you can even just do like a, a muscle energy, like hip flexor stretch, and you'll get it to click right back into place. On smaller people too. Um, the older they are, the less likely that one's going to work. You may have to create more of a rotational shear. You may have to do some kind of, you know, P to A shearing motion. Um, but odds are you may actually have to work on that SI joint to get it to clear completely. But I've certainly in the past been able to clear my left SI joint dysfunction just by, by doing hip shifters like Don Tigny mobilizations and then treating uh, glute trigger points in my right lower glute. So luckily I've had just about every injury there is. So I keep joking with some of my providers. I'm like, you guys got to get hurt more, man. You've never felt this? <laughs> you've never had a stinger. You've never you know, had a, uh, your hands go numb. You've never had a torn muscle. You know, you've never had plantar fasciitis, peroneal neuritis. Yeah, I mean, I pretty much had it all at this point, right? <laughs> I was talking to Kenyon today because we were talking about, like, kickoff coverage, and I was showing him my finger because my finger just goes back. like oh, you know, it, just, it just keeps going, right? <laughs> so when I, when I dislocated it playing football, the, the fingers went that direction, and so the ligaments were torn, and so I don't have any capacity to resist that force there. So that's not very good because eventually I'll start to destroy the joint. Yeah. Well, it's, you know, it's just one of those injuries, you know, so yeah, you name it, I pretty much had a broken bones, torn muscles, SI joint dysfunction, disc herniations, compression fractures in my spine, uh, herniated discs in my neck, torn labrum in the shoulder, torn rotator cuff in the shoulder, torn pec on the right side, fractured fingers, uh, fractured forearms, um, nerve entrapment, sciatica, uh, piriformis syndrome have had it, IT band syndrome had it, uh, peroneal tendinopathy had it, uh, plantar fasciitis had it. Um, patellar tendonitis have it, massive chondromalacia patellae have it, uh, torn labrum in my right hip have it, uh, severe osteoarthritis in my left hip have it. Um, now, are you always in pain? I don't. Have you just, like, I don't know. That's a good question. I don't think so. At least not any more pain than you know. I've lifted weights and worked out for so long that I'm used to some level of pain. And I, people are like, well, soreness isn't pain. I'm like, well, yeah, it is. It's your, your body feeling pain, right? So I'm not sure. The way that I quantify pain is if I physically have to alter my lifestyle. Like if I'm limping or if I'm so aware of it, like when you get a headache, right? Like that's pain to me. But if, I think tension doesn't really quantify in my head as pain. It's not something that I'm aware of. And I think most people as we age are that way. Um, particularly as you start to hit middle age, women, like women between 30 and 55 are in chronic pain and they don't even know they're in pain. Part of that is the selfless nature of, you know, having to raise other people and you don't have time to, to worry about yourself. Um, so when we work on them, a lot of times they think the treatment feels good because they're just in this chronic low level pain and don't even realize it. Now, these women are also most likely to be diagnosed as fibromyalgia because a lot of things hurt, right? Your neck hurts, your traps hurt, your hips hurt, your lower back hurts, your knee hurts. So to a primary care doctor that doesn't understand that, doesn't have pain, and has never been an athlete, they're just going to be like, oh, something's wrong. You have, you know, restless leg, fibromyalgia. Here, take this Lyrica. And then you may have swelling and all these other side effects that come along with it. But they just, they have, they have no frame of reference on what pain or injuries actually feel like. So most of the therapies and techniques, or not most of them, but a lot of them that I've come up with are literally for me treating myself when I've hurt myself. So I always like to try to find new ways to hurt myself. You know, ribs out, you know. Pick, pick one. Disc herniations in the neck, AC joint separations, yeah, fully ruptured pec, torn hamstrings both sides, torn quad on one side. That's all right. I mean, there's something to that. I think, I think at a certain point in life, you realize that being not being in pain is really nice. So I don't do crazy stuff anymore because I don't like to hurt. 
so you won't see me snowboarding or, or you know playing football or anything like that anymore. Um, plus, I've been out of those games for so long that my tissue isn't ready for it, like we talked about before. Like, you're almost guaranteed to get hurt, you know. So when I get in there and wrestle sometimes with the guys, I know that I'm playing with fire, you know. <laughs> Actually, I was just wrestling. I was I was rolling with, with Carlos a while back, and I ended up, like, tearing the cartilage in my rib. Oh, my you know, stupid. <laughs> my my body's not ready and used to it. Like, I need to, to work my way up to it, right? So then every time I try to do attraction for, like, three weeks, I'd get this sharp stabbing pain. I'm like, ugh, ugh. <clears throat> Because I had to wait for it to calcify. So, <laughs> all right. So upslip, downslip. So therapeutic options: we can do myofascial release on the inferior downslip sacroiliac joint. We can do myofascial release on all spastic muscles, especially the rectus abdominis and iliopsoas. So one of the best stretches for somebody with acute lower back pain, particularly sacroiliac joint pain, is a standing quadricep stretch. What we don't want them doing is bending forward. All those are very vulnerable positions for them. So one of the best things we can have them do is just like several rounds of standing quad stretches and several rounds of standing calf stretches. That will allow them to be able to get their heel to the ground, which is necessary to be able to take the pressure off of the SI joints. Mm -hmm. They also can't stand up straight if their quads are overengaged. So when we have sharp pain, we'll almost always move into flexion positions. So our flexor spasm. Hip flexor, rectus femoris, hamstring, calf, excuse me, rectus abdominis. So we've got to get that to calm down to get ourselves in line with gravity so we can get that other process out of the way. Usually on acute lower back pain, SI joint issues, the first 24 hours is going to be a wash no matter what you do. So we're just trying to limit um, spasm at that point. So we may also have them do hip shifters or hip sliders to try to get them back to neutral because the longer they're crooked, the more the consequences we're going to have and the more work we're going to have to unravel that. Um, we want to work Tylenol for the first you know, 72 hours because in this case, the, there's pain causing muscle spasm. So anti-inflammatories generally aren't going to work very well because it's not really inflammation that's the problem. It's pain causing spasm causing pain. Also, ice is going to be more effective in that first 72-hour interval. They'll want to put heat on there, and heat will feel good while it's on there, but as soon as they take it off of there, it's going to spasm up really bad. Because like we talked about before, the body's always trying to move towards homeostasis. So with the heat on there, your body's going to pull blood away from that tissue to try to cool it down because we're putting a bunch of heat on it. And then as soon as it goes away, that tissue's going to harden up and stiffen up and feel really painful. So the ice is going to do more, mostly it's going to numb it more than anything, which is kind of what we're looking for. If we can numb it, then we can break the spasm, which then can lower the pain and we can get better motion back again. Okay, so that's when we're dealing with the acute lower back pain. And then, you know, tape or back braces can be very effective there too to take some of the pressure off of the, the muscles and the discs. So we'll do like a, we call it a Ninja Turtle tape job. We tape their entire back just so that their muscles aren't having to work so hard. So that's also very effective. All right, so we can do manual correction of bony structures. So in this case, you know, if we have a posterior tilt, we need to move it forward. Or we need to gap it if that SI joint is actually really stuck. That will usually take away the very sharp component to it. So spinal manipulation could be an intervention here that we use. We can insert, a, a, or we can put an insert into the shoe on the downslope side. So if they have a short leg, sometimes if they're leaning over, if we can put a, like a Dr. Scholl's in the other side, that'll at least make them more level at the pelvis so there's less pressure on the SI joint. So that can be an intervention sometimes. Uh, a vast majority of lower back pain comes from sacroiliac joint dysfunction, so a lot of it. Um, the pubic symphysis will share the same movements as the ilia bilaterally. You can correct these positions for better results as well, so I'll use the little clicker sometimes on that. Like if I feel like there's some adductor issues or things like that, sometimes that helps. Actually, I actually haven't done that in a few years, but it's something I used to do a lot more of. Um, so in this slide here, I've got hip mobility stretches. So these are called Dontigny mobilizations. They're a combination of self um, PNF stretching to basically try to get the muscles to release and then hip slides to try to get the SI joints to move. There have been times in the past where I've hurt myself that that was very effective and it got me out of trouble. Um, even sometimes when I feel like coming on, if I do these, a lot of times I can get some movement in there again and it keeps me away from the edge. And then right here where I'm kind of showing is the lacrosse ball release um, along the sacrum, um, particularly exactly where, where we want to do that myofascial release on the opposite side to get the movement back. And apparently I put a reading assignment there on the sacroiliac joint. So um, this is a, a study from the, the uh, physical therapy department at the University of Buffalo. Um, and you guys will read it when you get to it, but what it talks about is referral patterns from sacroiliac joint, which can refer to the groin, the foot, and they can mimic um, disc herniation symptoms as well. So they've been able to mark or, or map a lot of the SI joint referral patterns, and they're all over the place. It's kind of wild. Um, 
So I thought that was very interesting. So finally, our third component, we have the polyarthropathy of the pelvis. So this theory acknowledges that all individual movements of pelvic bones in all possible directions, including all the previously mentioned movements, along with the following movements are possibilities. Nutation, counter-nutation, so that means the sacrum tilts or tilts backwards, right? Inflare and outflare of the ilium, both individually and bilaterally. So you could have an inflare or an outflare or a combination of those movements, both individually and bilaterally. Then elevation or depression of the hemipubic bone. So it could go up or down there as well. So the pubic symphysis or the ischium could move as well independently. Um, these are more likely to be seen in early Danzler's disease and pregnant and postpartum patients. Or any other kind of patient that has some sort of collagen disorder. Okay. So remember, start simple, then move to advanced theories. So when you're looking at the pelvis... Keep it simple, stupid. Start with the most simplistic one. If that doesn't work, then you're going to move on to your next one. If that doesn't work, then we can move all the way, all the way back to this very advanced the the uh, theory. We're thinking about all these little things interplaying and, and moving around. So I've definitely seen patients that have bilateral external flare. They're usually postpartum. Um, we have to, may have to get them a sacral leg joint belt to hold them together there. But it's a very specific, unique pain presentation. They're not locked up or spasm. They have this searing, burning pain along their sacrum on both sides um, that doesn't get better with anything, and it's usually really hard for them to lay down. So one way I'll test that is I'll have them lay on their side, and I'll get on the anterior aspect of the ASIS here, and I'll approximate them like this, almost compressing the front. So think about that. If I'm, if I'm externally rotated, I'm pinching the SI joints. If I move the front parts together, it's going to open up the back part a little bit. If that's very relieving to them, then that's the way I'm going to go. I may, you know, m manually mobilize them together like that, kind of pushing and doing some, like, grade 2 mobs. Or I may uh, prescribe them a belt to where they're getting compression up in the front. I've also taught people in the past how to put, like, a foam roller against the wall in the anterior aspect and hip slide into it to keep that thing from opening up too far. So also I would need that glute max to calm down, right, because the glute max if it's stronger than the joint itself, is going to create an external flare. So my ligaments are too weak or my connective tissue is too weak, currently like somebody who's pregnant or postpartum or has EDS, then the muscle is capable of actually pulling the bone out of place because if I yank on it, if that structure that I'm yanking on isn't strong enough, it's going to move the structure. Make sense? Now, on the normal person, that shouldn't happen, right? But, you know, it does happen in some people. So remember, your reference point changes the way you look at it. Could the lumbar spine be rotated on a straight pelvis? Could the femurs be rotated within the acetabulum? So what am I looking at? What's my reference point? Do I have an external flare or is my femur internally rotated? Same thing. Right. They could be the same thing, right? It just depends. So why would I treat one and not the other, potentially? Well, I might do both. Right? I might pick or choose one. But unfortunately, in the dogma of PT world, chiral world, or whatever else, um, they fixate on pelvic motion only, and not necessarily the femur and the acetabulum, or the L-spine on the pelvis. So it all just depends on the reference point and where you're looking at it. And sometimes you need to correct both. Like, for example, if I had, like, a right QL issue, right, so the right QL attaches to the ribs and to the spine there and to the ilium, and it was overactive on one side, then my oblique was overactive on the other side, that combination torque could create a rotation or an upslip. So really, you need to rule out all the muscular components first and then take a look afterwards because they could appear to have some sort of movement, and once you clear out all the muscles around the area, then they don't have it anymore. If you try to treat by manipulating or moving the bones first, it might be better temporarily, but then it's going to go right back. That's what you hear a lot with, like, chiropractors or osteopaths is, like, you know, it felt better until I got to the door. It felt better until the next day, and it went right back. So with manipulation, a bone moving could happen by one of two ways. Either there's an acute incident, so, like, it came out, it moved, so more likely to be seen in, like, the ribs or, you know, the carpal bones or things like that. Um, or it's a chronic issue, right? So the muscles are pulling us out of place. So if it's a chronic issue, by manipulating, you're not really going to change it long term because the muscles, the imbalances are what's pulling you out of position, like an internal rotation of the humerus or, you know, uh, uh, anterior rotation of the scapula is related to the T-spine. You can do a PDA thrust there, and that'll feel nice for a few hours, but we haven't changed the tissues at all. So, of course, that's not going to last a long time. Why would it? All right. So we'll jump to the head, neck, and trunk here. So the spine, the human spine column is compromised of five distinct regions that develop by the age of 10. The cervical region has a lordosis and has seven cervical vertebrae. The thoracic region has a kyphosis and has 12 thoracic vertebrae. The lumbar region has lordosis and has five lumbar vertebrae. In the sacral region, the units are fused together into one bone. The anterior portion of the spine, including the bodies of the, verte the vertebra and the intervertebral disc, is designed to support and to withstand axial loading. 
So the, the main purpose of the actual vertebral bodies is to give us the ability to stand upright and be bipedal. Okay. The posterior aspects protect the spinal cord and allow movement and attachment sites for posterior muscles. So that's talking about our lamina, our spinous processes, our pedicles, and those kind of structures. Okay. The cervical spine. The cervical spine allows the most movement so the head can turn, allowing total visual field and mobility for the head. So C1 of the atlas has no vertebral body and allows the nodding motion of the skull. So C0 and C1 have like little notches, and we create nutation and counter nutation there. So that's this motion. This is all at C0, C1 primarily. Okay. It has the longest transverse processes of the cervical region, and they can be palpated laterally. So those are going to be right under the mastoid processes. You'll feel them. Okay. It has a superior process called the dens that is held into the skull by strong ligaments, the apical ligament and the alar ligament. So... By the way, people that have some sort of compromise there, they have rheumatoid arthritis, which causes rigidity of those things. Those are not candidates for neck manipulation. Okay. C2, or the axis, there's another name for it, the epistrophus, so that might be a test question. Okay. Allows a greater degree of rotation. Epistrophus, E-P-I-S-T-R-O-P-H-A-E-U-S. Allows the greatest degree of range of rotation at C1 and 2. So the vast majority of the rotation in your neck comes at C1, C2. So if somebody's having problems rotating side to side, it could be a problem there. But we also have to look upstream potentially too. So one of the main culprits, so say I'm having a hard time looking to the left, right? And I feel like I'm bunched up right here. One of the things that could be limiting are the musculature here. So it could be, you know, splenius capitis. It could be even the SCM. If my SCM is too tight here and it doesn't allow this kind of rotation... One thing that I can do is treat it the mastoid, and then I may get full range of motion there and not feel like I had this bony fixation at C2-3 on this other side. So something to keep in mind why we might be feeling bony fixations. So there's a lot of components that go into rotational shear and rotational forces. Remember, we're spinning, right? So in order to get that nice spin, we've got to have, nice, we have, got to have torsion on both sides. If I'm too tight here, I'm, I'm not going to have that, that clear rotation. It's going to come off track a little bit. All right, the nuchal ligament traverses along the spinous from C7 to the external occipital protuberance, or EOP, and checks flexion of the head of the spine, also known as the ineon. That's another word for the EOP, I-N-I-O-N, because we need all these different words for these structures. I-N-I-O-N? Yep, or in ion. Okay, the, so let's talk about the nuchal ligament for a second. It's technically a ligament, so it does it checks the forward falling of the head. Um, but histologically, it does have tissue that's much more reminiscent of fascia or tendon. So similar to the patellar ligament, right, histologically is much more like a tendon than a ligament. The ACL is a very true ligament. The patellar ligament is actually more like a tendon. By definition, it attaches from bone to bone, but cellularly it has more elastic tissue. It has some sort of contraction as well. So... Thickening of the nuchal ligament, which is fairly common, can certainly cause cervicogenic referral. It can cause pain in the neck, and it can also limit rotation bilaterally, and it'll certainly limit flexion. It responds very well to myofascial work. So even though it's a ligament, it doesn't respond like a normal ligament does. You don't have to stretch it necessarily. It does respond to inhibition. Inhibition is pressure. So muscles, to some extent tendons, and to some extent fascia, respond to pressure or manual work. C7 is the vertebral prominence, the most palpable of the cervical vertebrae. So when we're trying to find a reference point, C7 sticks out the most. It's got the, the biggest spinous process, and that's where we're referencing when we're palpating. So T1 will be slightly underneath that. It won't be quite as prominent. So it can give you a landmark to work from. 50% of the rotation of the cervical spine comes from C1 and 2. The most flexion and extension occurs between C5 and 6 and C6 and C7. So the, the coupled motion is rotation towards the side of lateral flexion. So because of the shape of the, the cervical vertebrae, so when I, when I laterally tilt like this, what happens is the spinous process is moved that way relatively. I don't know if you guys can feel that on yourselves, but as I lateral flex, the spinuses move away. The lumbar spine is the opposite. So the coupled motion, the, the shape of the vertebrae kind of tilt in and down towards the same side, sort of the concavity. So when we see somebody doing a manipulation, for example, if you really wanted to have true biomechanical sound manipulations, you would actually have the head turned towards the side of the thrust. You're actually uncoupling those, those vertebrae by twisting the head the opposite direction. They're not designed to move that way while we're lateral bending this way. We're stretching out ligaments and we're uncoupling. doesn't mean that that's what they need. It actually is doing harm. 
because like I said, if we want to you know use correct biomechanics there, lateral flexion with a little bit of nose towards is, is the correct biomechanical way. This way and this way is actually incorrect. It uncouples the joints themselves. It's incorrect motion. In the lumbar spine, it's okay to move away from it because the spinous is moved towards that side during rotation. So they, they actually allow the vertebral body to go the opposite direction. Does that make sense? So when I laterally bend here, if my spinuses go that way, my vertebral bodies come this way. So I'm moving down in this way, is, is the way the vertebra should move. And that has to do with the, the facet angles and the actual shape of the vertebra. So the facet angles are, are roughly 45 degrees in the cervical spine. Okay. So a couple of motion is rotation like we talked about. So in the T-spine, the thoracic spine is comprised of 12 vertebrae, which allow rib attachments that protect the internal organs and assist in respiratory motions. Rib 1 articulates via cartilage to the sternum. It doesn't actually have a joint like the rest of them. 2 through 9 will attach either actually they have a, a costovertebral joint or they'll attach via the rest of the cartilage. Okay, So T1 has the ability to disarticulate much more so than 2 through, and two, two through 9. So that's why if somebody has some sort of damage up here, that, that vertebra and that rib can move up and down, particularly with the amount of force placed on it because of the scalings. So rib 2 through 9 attached to the sternum and manubrium and form synovial joints. Uh, thoracic mobility is very limited, and we can see only about 4 to 6 degrees of flexion and extension. So when people talk about creating thoracic extension, they're actually lying because you can't create thoracic extension. The way the facet joints are angled is about 80 degrees, so thoracolumbar extension, the combined entire process from T1 to L5, we can create some extension, but the vast majority of that comes from the last three or four thoracic vertebrae, which start to take on shapes of lumbar vertebrae, and then the actual upper lumbar vertebrae as well. So what you'll see in, in transitional areas is the last two or three vertebrae in each area start to take on characteristics of the region above or below. So C7 takes on more characteristics of the thoracic spine, and T1 takes on characteristics more of the cervical spine, and vice versa. T12 looks almost like a lumbar vertebra. And L1 and L5 look distinctly different. L5 is much bigger, and it doesn't have as long of uh, uh, transverse processes. They have mammillary processes, which is a little bit different. So we can't really extend the T-spine. It's not designed to work that way. If we did that, we would actually be damaging the facet joints. So we don't really want to work on thoracic extension. Your thoracic spine is not designed to extend by the shape of the vertebrae themselves because they're wedged forward. If we do that, what you're going to be doing is potentially chipping the bones on the back edge and then overstretching the ligaments on the front. But it, before that ever happened, you would run your spinous processes into each other and actually damage them. Okay. So when we say thoracic extension, you know, what are we talking about? We're talking about, well... We want it to be upright. We want it to be in a right position relative to the scapulas. That's what they really mean to say. But we can't really extend our thoracic spine, just like we can't really rotate your lumbar spine. Like your, your T-spine is designed to create rotation. That's its prime motion. If you look at the facet joints there, you can see that. So somebody go up there and just kind of move them side to side just so you can kind of feel the motion. Yeah, jump up there and do it. So ribs 1, 2, excuse me, 1, 10, 11, and 12 articulate with the vertebral bodies only. So move each individual vertebrae on each other. Do you see the shape of the facet joints? They allow rotation if you look at the angles of them. <laughs> but you can see, right, like the angles, like they're not going to allow extension or flexion. If you try to extend that, the facet joint is going to run into itself. Now, when you look at the lumbar spine, see how it's designed very nicely for flexion and extension? Yeah, giant gaps between them. Mm -hmm. But if you try to rotate it, those facet joints are going to run into each other. Yeah, because they're a lot thicker. Yeah, for sure. But just think about trying to move one vertebrae individually side to side. Grab L5 and try to twist it. Grab it by its finest. Right. And try to twist it. See? See how it runs into the facet joint? It can't rotate. And those may not, you know, on a regular, like, um, spine that doesn't have ribs on it, it's kind of easier to play with. Mm -hmm. Like, the spine model I have in my room. That one really is. Yeah. So you can see there's, there's the ability to go side to side there because of the set joint angles. It's, uh, it's okay. not broken, but it's 
So rib one attaches on the manubrium, but often will fail from a, to form an attachment point. It's free floating. So it has been documented. That there's a lot of people that their rib ones don't articulate and attach completely. So ribs eight through ten share a cartilage attachment point. And cervical ribs are, are often present at C7 in roughly 1 in 200 people with females having a higher rate. So what happens there is their C7, their transverse process, starts to elongate and take on a rib-like form. Mm -hmm. This can lead to something called thoracic outlet syndrome because there's not enough space there. So we really need that thoracic outlet to get the nerves and the blood supply to the arms. If you have an extra structure there, like either an apical tumor or a cervical vertebrae, excuse me, a cervical rib, we don't have any space there. So... Um, we had a patient, she's a surgical PA a while back, and she was kind of losing sensation in her hand. And I was like, nah, you have a cervical rib. And everybody told her it's crazy because TOS is so rare and blah, 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 blah. Well, come to find out, she had a very long um, transverse process there. And they were able to remove it, and she got her, the control of her hand back. Then she went out and got breast implants, which caused a lot of torque again, and she started losing sensation on her hands. So, the lead horse to water, right? All right, so with the ribs... Respiration. Expansion of the thoracic cavity is driven in three planes, the vertical, the anterior-posterior, and the transverse. The vertical plane is extended by the help of the diaphragm contracting and the abdominal muscles relaxing to accommodate the downward pressure that is supplied to the abdominal viscera by the diaphragm contracting. A greater extension can be achieved by the diaphragm itself moving down rather than simply the domes flattening. The second plane in the anterior-posterior and, and uh, this is expanded by a movement known as the pump handle. So the downward sloping uh, nature of the upper ribs are such because they enable this to occur. When the external intercostal muscles contract and lift the ribs, the upper ribs are able also to push the sternum up and out. This movement increases the anterior-posterior diameter, so it increases that direction of the thoracic cavity and hence aids breathing further. So finally, you have the transverse. In this situation, it involves mainly the lower ribs. Some say it's the 7th through 10th ribs in particular, with the diaphragm's central tendon acting as the fixed point. When the diaphragm contracts, the ribs are able to evert and produce what is known as the bucket handle movement, facilitated by gliding at the cost of vertebral joints. In this way, the transverse diameter is expanded and the lungs can fill. Okay, so the main way that we breathe, right, is contraction of the diaphragm. It goes downward, creates a negative pressure loop, and then we breathe in. A lot of people will preach that you only need to be breathing diaphragmatically. Well, that, that would be great if we never had to exert ourselves. But we actually want the ribs to continue to be able to move because if they don't move, what will happen? They'll start to stiffen and ossify and the cartilage will get tight. So you want to be able to do both individually and, and in a pinch, like if you had to run from a dog or something, you would sure like to have both aspects to be able to get the most amount of oxygen possible. You don't want to be diaphragmatically breathing when you're running away from a wild animal. So the real world you know, process of this isn't always the best thing. Would it be a good idea to train your diaphragm? Yeah, I think it would. I think it would help you breathe better, certainly. But you also have to recognize all these secondary respiratory muscles, which is basically anything that attaches to a rib. So serratus, yeah, back minor is one. Uh, I mean, go subclavius, serratus anterior, serratus posterior or inferior, um, rhomboids. And not as much, not as much scalenes, for sure. Um, you know, maybe the clavicle, but not, not so much. Um, rectus abdominis, right? These are all muscles that if they're too tight, they don't allow rib expansion very well, and then we're not going to get optimal oxygen intake. So we had one of, the, like, the fastest runners in the country came in today, and uh, she ran, like, a 4, 14 mile or something like that. She just set the NCAA record. But what we found on her is we have this sling system, right, when we're running. So her right shoulder to her left glute is her tight sling. So what we found there is when we tried to create thoracic rotation, we couldn't rotate her to the right very well. So what we found was the serratus posterior inferior was tight. So all I did was pin the muscle there and had her move up and down through that range. And just by doing that a few times, she was able to completely create thoracic rotation to the right. Didn't move any bones or anything like that. Also, she was able to take a deeper breath because that rib was able to move away from the spine because serratus posterior inferior basically attaches those ribs to the spine. If it's too tight, the ribs don't get away from the spine as well. Make sense? So... Anytime you treat these areas, usually people are like, oh, wow, I can breathe better. Okay? So we want both of those things to work well. We want, we want to be able to expand our ribs to create more space for our lungs, as well as we want the diaphragm to drop down to be able to work efficiently also. Because, yeah, there was a big movement of people like, oh, you don't want to be a chest breather. I mean, air is good. Right? Like, however you got to do it. All right, so ribs. In several ethnic groups, most significantly the Japanese, uh, the 10th rib is... I don't know what I did with the rest of that slide. Sorry. 
I'll have to look that up for you guys. You can just drag it up. Let me see here. It's in there somewhere. I don't know what it is. Most of these things I don't even I wouldn't even need a bra like a, a PowerPoint right, like I know all the information. But like some of these odd like academic facts, I'm like, wait, what was that? Oh yeah. There we go. The tenth rib is sometimes a floating rib in several ethnic groups, so it doesn't attach all the way. So instead of just being the eleventh and, and twelfth are floating ribs, there are some ethnic groups, the Japanese in particular apparently, <laughs> um, that have that issue that it, that it's a floating rib as well. So you got to be careful with those 11th and 12th ribs because if you move them like the wrong way, sometimes if you're trying to do like a lumbar roll or something like that, you can move one of the ribs out of place and they'll have that really sharp stabbing pain there. Um, several of our therapists, as they were starting to learn how to treat, they felt the restriction, they felt like it was tight muscle there. And some people have very narrow windows between the ribs and their, their ilium. So some people like yeah. it's very small amount of space. So they were pushing and they were feeling they were they were feeling muscular tension and they were on the, the floating rib and they ended up moving those out of place and causing a really sharp stabbing pain that takes about four weeks to go away. You know, um, I, I'm pretty sure they learned their lessons on those, but you know, it's something that you got to be careful with and make sure you're not, you know, when you're trying to treat a QL or a psoas or something that you're not on one of those ribs because when you move them, there's not a lot of ability to move it back. Um, and I've, I've even known providers, none of ours, but I've actually broken people's ribs that are just, just holding and pressing on points. It can be. That happens to be a lot here. Okay, I don't want to edit this anymore. How do I go back? Whatever. All right, lumbar spine. The lordosis that's created by the age of 10 is thought to be created by the development of the psoas muscle. So five vertebrae allow transmission of force from the pelvis into the axial spine. Side of the most disc damage is going to be between L5 and L4 and then L4 and L5. So the, so in, anywhere in the spine, you're going to have a lot more disc damage there, which makes sense because that's where the most amount of force is transferred to. Okay. Vertebral bodies and discs are much larger in this region to support increased weight from above. And then we have a 90-degree facet angle, which limits rotation of the spine, so meaning we cannot twist our L-spine. So when everybody wants to lay on their side and twist their L-spine, they could actually be damaging themselves and hurting themselves and uncoupling the joint range of motion. So facet joint damage can occur in forced rotation, so anytime you try to force that rotation, you're running those facet joints into each other. Lumbar spine possesses the greatest flexion and extension of the spine, so it's really good at flexing and extending. Degenerative disc disease can lead up to 70% of the weight bearing being held on the posterior elements and the facet articulations. So think about that. Like the disc is supposed to give you spacing there, but as it degenerates and it shrinks down, instead of those facet joints being joints, they start to become weight bearing, and that's where a lot of people's pain comes from. It starts to physically compress there. Our spinal landmarks. During palpation, certain spinal levels can be found reliably by moving to certain anatomical positions. So C3 is about where the hyoid bone is. C6 is the cricoid cartilage. T4 is the sternum manubrium juncture. L4 is the iliac crest. And S2 is the PSIS. Joints of the spine. The motion segments of the spine consist of two adjacent vertebrae, three intervertebral joints, the soft tissues, the intervertebral uh, disc, longitudinal and intersegmental ligaments, and the capsules of the facet joints. The disc and bilateral force, excuse me, facet joints form a triangle where motion at one joint always produces motion at the other two joints. So the disc and bilateral facet joints form a triangle where motion at one joint always, always produces motion at the other two joints. Okay. The motions are flexion, extension, lateral flexion, rotation, anterior, posterior shear, lateral shear, and distraction compression. Those are all the particular motions. You can have it in our vertebral joints or vertebral units or segments. The intervertebral disc, the disc allows protection of the facet joints from comp compression and injury. The disc is composed of three parts, the annulus fibrosus, the nucleus pulposus, which is about 80% water, and two hyaline cartilaginous plates, which separate the disc material from the vertebral bodies. The fibers of the annulus run in alternate directions in each layer, so that gives us strength. So the annulus basically one layer goes this way, the other layer goes this way. Okay? The discs account for about 25% of the height of the vertebral column. Water is lost during the day from compression forces within the nucleus, but are restored during sleep. This process is called imbibition. Blood supply to the nucleus pulses disappears during the early 20s, excuse me, during your 20s, and ability to restore hydration greatly diminishes. Repeated microtrauma from lifting heavy objects causes stiffening, and the fibers are decreased in elasticity. Acute herniations are much greater increase from age 30 to 50 due to stiffening and lack of imbibition. 
So when we're talking about acute injuries from the discs, that, that demographic is going to be the highest, 30 to 50. 50 to 90-year-olds may lose disc height and develop abnormal kyphosis. So as you see people start to age, if they don't really take care of themselves, as we start to create kyphosis there, you know, exponentially more weight starts to go onto it and damage the front part as well, and then we end up in that stuck forward position. Anterior and posterior longitudinal ligaments. The ALL attaches at the annulus and anterior vertebral bodies. The ALL limits backwards bending. So the PLL attaches along the posterior vertebral body and annulus. The PLL is minorly involved in checking flexion of the spine. You're going to get more checking of that from the supraspinous ligament that goes from spinous to spinous. Here is Schurman's disease. So it's characterized by end plate damage in Schmorl's nodes. It's often associated with hyperkyphosis or hypokyphosis. It can lead to increased incidence of back pain at the patty as the patient ages. Okay, so these right here are Schmorl's nodes. So you see these verte uh, vertical uh, disc herniations. They actually break down the cortical bone. Very painful because bone has what? A lot of blood supply and a lot of nerve supply. Um, so when somebody has an acute Schmorl's node issue, um, normal stuff that we'd use like Williams flexion ex exercises or McKinsey extension exercises will not benefit this patient at all because it's going to mechanically push the disc material into the sides of the bones. Sometimes traction will help them, but not always. Thoracolumbar fascia. So the thoracolumbar fascia, the lumbodorsal fascia, is a deep investing membrane which covers the deep muscles of the back and the trunk. It's made up of three layers, anterior, middle, and posterior. The anterior layer is the thinnest and posterior layer is the thickest. Two spaces are formed between these three layers of fascia. Between the anterior and middle layers lies the quadratus lumborum muscle, so it's actually embedded within the fascia. The erector spinae muscles is enclosed between the middle and posterior layers. So again, the, the erector spinae are actually in the fascia itself. Above, it passes in front of the straightest posterior superior and is continuous with similar investing fascia on the back of the neck, the nuchal fascia. So when people look down and they feel that pull and that tug that goes down there, sometimes the later scapula, but more likely it's the investing fascia and the nuchal fascia. Yeah. So the ligamentum flava, and the ligamentum flava, singular ligamentum flava, it's Latin for a yellow ligament, so that might be a test question, are ligaments of the spine. They, they connect the lamina of adjacent vertebrae all the way from the second verte vertebra, the axis, to the first segment of the sacrum. So you don't have a ligamentum flavum above C2. The ligamentum flavum can be um, important because hypertrophy of it will cause spinal stenosis because it's inside the vertebral canal. They're best seen on the interior of the vertebral column when looked at from the outer surface as they appear short, being overlapped by the lamina of the vertebral arch. Each ligament consists of two lateral portions which commence one on either side of the roots of the articular process and extend backwards to the point where the lamina meets to form the spinous process and the posterior margins of two portions are in contact, yada, yada, yada. In the neck region, the ligaments are thin but broad and long, and they are thicker in the thoracic and thickest in the lumbar region. So that thickness, which is helpful to protect us when it becomes hypertrophic, will actually create spinal stenosis because there's not enough space for the spinal cord. Particularly if you have congenitally short pedicles or some other issue, then we can really be dealing with neurogenic claudication or some other kind of spinal cord pinching. The ligamentum flavum, so hypertrophy, again, has clinical significance because it can contribute to spinal stenosis. Spondylolisthesis, this is a hangman's fracture. It's a, Actually, this is not a hangman's fracture, I'm sorry. A hangman's fracture is a specific type of spondylolisthesis where the second cervical vertebra is displaced anteriorly relative to the C3 vertebra due to fracture of the C2's vertebra, uh, vertebra's pedicles. So you can understand where the name comes from. We talk about somebody breaking their neck when they hang them. They usually don't die of suffocation. That fracture causes that to move forward, compresses the, uh, the spinal cord there, and they stop breathing as a result of that. About 15 seconds worth. Okay, right here we're looking at an L4 on an L5. So here's the L5 vertebra here. Here's the sacrum. See how L4 has shifted forward relatively to it? So also we can't shift forward without some level of damage to the disc, right? So what's going on here is we've got overstretching of the ALL, right? Has to. Right? To enable this to go forward, the ALL has to overstretch. So it's being stretched out. So that can cause pain. Okay? And then what's going on here is we've got probably a fracture of the pars there, the pars interarticularis, which is allowing this to move forward, even though the posterior element may stay back somewhat more. Okay? Also, the supraspinous ligament is being stretched as well, at least at that point, because it's dipping in. So we have to think about all the associated structures when we see some sort of movement like that. Every single one of those muscles could, can cause enough pain to cause a spasm. So it doesn't always have to be the disc, right? 
So our types of spondylolisthesis, we have the isthmic spondylolisthesis, which is the most common form. It's called spondylolytic spondylolisthesis. So let's break down these words, right? So spondylosis means what? 